Hi, this is George Katouf for AgelessTimeless.com, where we try to answer the question, what do you expect for someone my age? Our response, excellence. We try to interview individuals over the age of 50 or those that contribute to the individuals over the age of 50 to ensure that we're doing everything possible to maximize our health potential. Because remember, your body is a temple. I was watching a recent YouTube lecture and the gentleman that was engaging the audience asked a simple question. How many of you would like to live to 100? And when I was watching this, I thought everybody would raise their hand and be actively involved in saying, yes, let me be the first. Surprisingly, he didn't have a quorum of people who wanted to live to be 100. When he rephrased the question and said, what if you could live to be 100, but feel like you did when you were in your 20s and 30s, all the hands shot up and everybody said okay to that. Today we have a gentleman who uh, I respect greatly because he's someone who has pioneered the concept of being ageless and timeless through his uh, terrific uh, physical attributes and his intellectual attributes as well. Today we have Dr. Bill Andrews with us. Uh, Dr. Andrews is the CEO and founder of Sierra Sciences. He, in 1997, with his team, got second place as uh, inventors uh, worldwide. In addition, uh, he's uh, so physically active. In his late 60s, he's still running uh, ultra marathons. And if you don't know what that is, that's a marathon plus. So sometimes 50 miles, sometimes 100 miles, sometimes less. And he's done this at high elevations. At the age of uh, 60, he ran 138 miles uh, in the Himalayan mountains with an 8,000 foot elevation. So it's a real pleasure and honor to have Dr. Bill Andrews with us today. Thank you for agreeing to the interview. Well, thank you. Let, let me say, uh, you had just mentioned uh, 8,000 feet elevation. It was actually 18,000 feet. Yeah, elevation. let me add another 10,000 to that because the 8,000 wasn't enough. <laughs> 8,000 is easy. Um, <laughs> thank but, you. Uh, yeah, no, thank you for having me on your program. Okay. So uh, it seemed like a lot happened to you at the age of 10. At the age of 10, your life's work was prompted by your father. And at the age of 10, your physicality was prompted by somebody, because yeah. that was the year that you ran your first uh, mile race. Could you talk a little bit about that, how that all came to fruition? Well, well first let me talk about the running. It's, I, my, I was a kid that had parents who never told me to stop running around the pool, you know. So I was running everywhere, and my parents were just shocked. With, I'd, I'd head out the front door to go to elementary school, and I would run to school. And uh, they, they, they thought, boy, something kind of weird with me. So uh, one day my father uh, surprised me. He had signed me up for a one mile race at uh, the Los Angeles Athletic Club. Uh, and uh, I was like, think, a mile? I've never run a mile. That seems like impossible to do. Uh, and it turned, it was in an indoor track uh, that was one tenth of a mile per lap. So we had to run around 10 times. And there was probably around 30 kids my age in that race and I uh, was like terrified about the race but I ended up lapping second place twice okay so I won the race but I mean I I stayed there for several minutes before second place even finished uh, the uh, uh, that's when I kind of got the idea you know this is fun I, I I'm an endurance runner I like it and uh, so I've been running ever since uh, you know, uh, we used to have a house in Lake Arrowhead, and I used to pride myself on how I could run all the way around Lake Arrowhead. I forget how many miles that is, maybe 15, 20 miles, and, and that was when I was a kid. But I, in high school, college, I was in cross country and track, um, and uh, when I went to graduate school, I started running marathons, and uh, I found out that I was more interested in 
the adventure of running because you can go places where you can't go with any other means. I was more interested in the adventure of running. Uh, and so I got really attracted to ultra marathon running, which is when I ran my first ultra marathon in uh, 1996. And uh, I was so blown away by it that I signed up for another one the very next weekend. <laughs> you know, I was, you know, crossing the finish line, I was stepping over bodies, lying over the ground. I didn't understand what was wrong with all these people, but they, you know, they were exhausted from the run. But I, uh, I, I did another one the very next weekend, and then, then that very so 1997, I signed up for a whole bunch of 50 mile races, and found out that uh, at the end of the race, I'd broken the world record for the most number of 50 mile races completed in one year, and I thought it was easy. I didn't even know there was a record. Uh, next year I did the same with the 100 mile distance uh, so I ran my first 100 mile race in uh, uh, January of 1998 and by September of 1998 I was told that I had broken the world record for the most number of 100 mile races ever run in one year uh, and it's my attitude has always been don't push it don't go fast have fun you know, when I, I always say, if it quits being fun, quit, save it for another day. Uh, and there were races that I didn't finish, too, and I don't count those, but, but still the ones that I did finish, I, I did. I, I just, if, you know, if I, if I don't feel right, I feel like something's I'm getting too tired or something like that, I, I don't push it. You know, I think that's really healthy, and that's always been a mental state of mind. Um, so I've never won a race. I, I win my age group all the time, but I think that's because everybody else in my age group are burned out from pushing so hard previously. Uh, I, I believe that actually endurance sports, whether you're kayaking, skateboarding, water, uh, water skiing, roller skating, uh, running, bicycling, kayaking, I might have said already, any, any of those things, they're really healthy for you. And studies have shown that people that do these sports and keep it fun we actually have longer telomeres than their friends of the same age that, that really push and stuff. It, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's my philosophy on running. I think I encourage everybody to get out there and run, but stop if it gets tough and walk. There's nothing wrong with walking. Uh, walking actually burns just as many calories per mile as running does. just takes you longer. Uh, but uh, at least, you know, run long enough to get your cardiovascular system going a little bit and then walk after that that's that's really good but that's that's my running story i think i've said everything there is to it i've, I've broken many many records i'm i'm turning 70 in a little over two years from now and i have every expectation of breaking the 100 mile distance record for the 70 year old age group uh and only because i break it every time uh it's easy <laughs> nobody's ever broken 20 hours at over 70 years old and uh uh, that's not going to be any problem at all. So unless I, unless something happens to my health in the next two years, I definitely plan on setting some more records soon. Um, so you don't have any problems with uh, knees, uh, hips, anything that has uh, deterred you? No, and there there are actually some really good studies now showing that that the main reason why uh, knees and ankles and hips give out is from inflammation, uh, and so, so if you're a runner that runs every two weeks and then runs a marathon, does really well, you'll be stiff as a board the next day, okay, from all the inflammation. And the inflammation is what causes the injuries. So I always preach, you know, don't push it. Run. I say run every day. I, I run literally six days a week, okay, and, and I'm always looking for trails to run for adventure that I haven't been on before because – you don't get bored in those kind of runs. You actually get to a point where you don't want to turn around and go back because you want to keep seeing where this trail goes. Uh, and that's, that's a, a, an incentive to keep going. But that's what I do. Uh, and uh, uh, I, people keep saying the only good older runners are the ones that started late because all the young runners burned out their knees and stuff like that. I, I have perfect knees, perfect hips, perfect ankles, um, and I've been running – competing in long distance running since I was 10 years old. What so, kind of pace would you typically keep when you were doing an ultra marathon? What, what would your mile pace be? It depends on the course, but if it was like a 
and I, I couldn't possibly do this because it would be too boring, but if I was to run 400 times around a track, uh, <clears throat> the pace would be somewhere probably around 11 minutes per mile uh, and uh, the whole average the whole time. Uh, and if, but, but that's too boring. I'm into the adventure. So I typically pick the races that go over 4,000 foot mountains and things like that. And so my average pace was sometimes be like 14, 15 minutes per mile. Uh, doing something like that, uh, and and you know I never it's sometimes sometimes if I feel like I'm getting close to like beating some type of record I'll push it. If you watch the movie The Immortalist, in fact I usually show clippings from it when I show running. You can see me running at 100 miles into the race, which is 138 total, and and I'm giving high fives to people, I'm waving to people, I'm I look like I'm completely just uh, uh, doing a walk in the park. Uh, and uh, I finished uh, fifth overall, not not just being the oldest person ever finished, but I finished fifth overall, I think, out of 12 runners, and every single one of them were younger than me. Um, so it's, uh, yes, yeah, so none of those problems have occurred. I think that, that the worst thing you can do is push too hard and not run often enough. You run every day, you keep your joints lubricated, uh, which prevents the uh, breakdown. I mean, it could... People say I'm just very lucky genetically, but I do have an identical twin brother with the identical genetics that I do, and he's having severe problems because he hasn't taken the same philosophies that I have. Uh, he's he's talking about getting his knees replaced and things like that. Um, but I'm 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 a long ways from ever even thinking about that. The other question you asked me about when I was 10 years old um, was uh, getting into anti-aging. Uh, my uh, childhood was. A little different. My, you know, there's not been a single person in the history of my family on both sides that ever graduated from college. But uh, uh, I, for some reason, was addicted to school, and especially science and medicine kind of stuff. And so even when I was in elementary school at 10 years old, my uh, teachers would send notes back to my patient, uh, parents saying that this guy is really, really interested in science and medicine. And so and, and not just science, but like astronomy and things like that, too. Um, so one day I was out in the front lawn looking through my 8-inch reflector telescope, which is another story behind why a 10-year-old kid would have something like that. Um, but uh, I was looking through the telescope. My father came out onto the lawn front yard and said to me, Bill, you know, since you're so interested in science and medicine, you should, when you grow up, become a doctor find a cure for aging and he said i don't know why nobody's done that yet uh and so he, two things one one is he thought aging would be easy to cure two he said it was a cure which is very few people understand the concept of aging being a disease and something that can be cured but he did that when i was 10 years old which is what 58 years ago okay and so so it, it became my obsession from when I was 10 years old. If, if you met any of my colleagues in high school and college, uh, you'd all, they'd all say, hey, this guy was obsessed with trying to cure aging. So uh, it's, been, it's been that way ever since. It's, the problem at first was, you know, I studied all the theories on aging, and I decided none of them made sense. I always say all the twos and twos have to add up. If, Certain things called aging, it has to explain everything, and nothing nothing really explained. I decided there had to be some kind of clock that's actually ticking inside of us that controls our aging, and the difficult was, what could that clock possibly be? Uh, I used to uh, I used to think of it like, like ride tickets at an amusement park. You know, you go to an amusement park, and every time you go on a ride, you lose a ticket. Right. Well, you know, when the, you spend your last ticket, the rides are over, and that would be the same as I said, as death being over. What is there? Something like that. Then, then in 1992, I heard Dr. Calvin Harley talk about the fact that telomeres shorten. And right away, I started thinking, oh, here's those ride tickets. Uh, and, uh, but they hadn't figured out a way to lengthen them to prove that they had a, either, either they were cause of aging or just a result of aging. And so I, uh, I instantly said, I'm available to come work with you guys uh, and try to and identify a way to lengthen telomeres uh, and 
they hired me, shortest job interview ever. Uh, and I discovered telomerase uh, within three months. And that's, that's been, been upstream from everything. We put telomerase into uh, normal skin cells going into Petri dish uh, back in the uh, late 1990s. And we showed that uh, lengthening their telomeres by, with that enzyme telomerase uh, reversed every marker of aging that we could measure in uh, human cells in the petri dish. And then uh, I also I also did the antisense of telomerase to show that I could kill every cancer cell by getting them to die of old age. And the company, Geron Corporation, decided, oh, we've got a cure for cancer and a cure for aging at the same time. What are we going to do? And the investors all said, cancer, cancer would be a better return on investment and quicker return on investment. So they told us all to stop working on aging. That's when I left Duron and started Sierra Sciences to focus on the aging aspect. And, I, and with their blessing, it was uh, uh, very, you know, they helped me out a lot in getting supplies and things like that to, to get the company going. And that was 20 years ago, and now I'm still working on that. Uh, they're still working on trying to uh, get the cancer problems, and they're finding that almost every time they inhibit telomerase to cure cancer, the body has the ability to have the cancer come back. To, to, cause the, and what we found is that short telomeres, uh, if you inhibit telomerase in a cancer cell and cause the telomeres to get shorter, the short telomeres induce so many mutations that the cancers can survive whatever you hit them with. So I no longer believe that inhibiting telomerase is a way to fight cancer, but I believe that turning on telomerase and lengthening telomeres is an excellent way to prevent cancer and to help your body fight cancer with uh, an enhanced immune system due to the two short telomeres uh, that there is. So, so, so that's what I preach right now is that uh, we're actually working on aging and cancer right now. Well, if I uh, am correct, and uh, I think it would be good for our uh, viewers because not everyone's familiar with uh, telomeres, uh, could you just briefly discuss what they are, please? Yeah, no, it, it's, I definitely skipped that part. Um, <laughs> so, so telomeres are really small things that are found at the tips of our chromosomes. I have a really good uh, slide presentation on where I zoom in on a human being to actually show what telomeres are. Um, chromosomes are where our genes are. They give us our eye color, our hair color. But they're really small things inside of our cells, inside of the nuclei of our cells. And they're almost like giant shoelaces. Okay, shoelaces, my favorite analogy was actually coined or came up with by Elizabeth Blackburn, who's one of the colleagues people I worked with in the early days. Uh, so if you think of our chromosome as a long shoelace, the aglets, so the caps on those shoelaces, are equivalent to the telomeres on your chromosomes. Uh, your DNA is a long, long string of beads. The beads are called bases. A typical chromosome is about 100 million bases in length, and at the very caps are these telomeres uh, that are equivalent to the aglets of the shoelaces. When, you, when your shoelace caps get really short, your shoelaces fall apart. Same is true for when your telomeres get really short, your chromosomes fall apart. And so keeping them long is really important. And we've also found that when the telomeres at the tip of our chromosomes start getting shorter, even when they're still long, they have an impact on the genes in the chromosome to turn them on and off, okay? And it's more like dimmer switches. So every gene has like a dimmer switch where you can turn it on or off to any level you want. And telomeres play a big role in controlling that. I always, I show models of the telomere actually folding over and like tapping genes uh, along the chromosome that uh, will turn them on or off or regulate their expression. Uh, uh, expression is the same as turning on and off, but regulate their turning on and off to some level. Um, but that's what telomeres are. Uh, we had shown that we could lengthen them in, in a Petri dish, human cells in a Petri dish, and reverse their aging as every, in every way imaginable, as I have mentioned. But then after I left Geron Corporation, because they decided to focus on cancer research, um, which I was very interested in cancer, but I, I just didn't think it was high enough. It's too, too many people were working on cancer and not enough people on aging. But some of the scientists that I was working with before 
continued the research anyway. Uh, and one of the studies that was done, they grew skin on the back of a mouse, human skin on the back of a mouse, treated it with telomerase to lengthen telomeres, and they saw skin age reversal in every way imaginable. Then Dr. Rhonda Pinnell at Harvard, using our technology, uh, engineered mice so that mice age like by telomere shorter. And mice don't age like humans. This is a misconception about a lot of people. Mice don't really age by telomere shorting. And so, but they, you can engineer them so they do. And remarkably, they start looking like old people when the telomeres get really short. But when they lengthen them, uh, they saw a reversal in everything. Their ability to breed, their memories came back, uh, their organs got uh, were functioning normally again, their skin came back, their hair color came back. Uh, everything imaginable about aging reversed. And let me just go off on a tangent here. Uh, a lot of people now keep saying that we've got to find biomarkers of aging. A lot of scientists say that one of the most important parts of curing aging is first finding biomarkers of aging. And I always say, um, we don't need biomarkers to, to reverse or to study aging. I always show, like, I, I pop up pictures of, like, the movie star Betty White when she was 25 and when she was 95. And I'll, I'll say, does anybody here not know which photo of Betty White was taken first? And I, they, they uh, it so gets a laugh, but the fact is, we don't need biomarkers. We know what's, we know what aging is. We, you know, I'm looking forward to the day when Betty White, who's 97 now, I think, uh, will walk out on a stage and look and feel and behave 25. Uh, and that's, you know, we are doing studies. Uh, we've got clinical studies going underway, and we, we are looking at 160 different biomarkers of aging. But, but the Betty White test is, I think, the most important test because. Uh, you know, if you just get more energy or something like that, that's not really reversing aging. And that's what 99% of the products on the market now tell you is that you reversed aging only because your energy got a little bit better. Uh, or other biomarkers of aging showed, uh, like methylation, showed reversal of methylation issues. Uh, but they didn't equate to actually having a person look and feel younger. So, um, <clears throat> but uh, that's what telomeres are. Uh, and I'm, I'm, my, I'm obsessed with trying to find ways to lengthen them and test them. And we, I did hint on the fact that we do have clinical studies getting underway soon using a gene therapy to deliver to all ways. So I'm hoping that we actually see age reversal in people, just like Dr. Rhonda Pinnell saw age reversal in mice. And it's my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, that when we are in utero, we have about 15,000 telomeres. Then when we're born, it goes to 10,000. And when we get to that 5,000 mark, it's not so good. For yeah, that's our, pretty liable age. Yeah, our, our cells, even in a Petri dish, our cells can't survive after the telomeres go down to 5,000 basis because the ends of the chromosomes are too unprotected. So... What are things, uh, first of all, that we can do to shorten our telomeres? In other words, poor lifestyles that people uh, incorporate. <laughs> I don't know why you would want to shorten them, but people do. Yeah, no, I, I always say, you know, if you ever want to, here's what to do. <laughs> uh, anything that increases oxidative stress and inflammation, those are probably the main things that cause accelerated telomere shortening. Um, so, uh, smoking, um, just uh, uh, psychological stress can actually do it. So, like caregivers of AIDS patients or, or Alzheimer's patients have been tested, and their telomeres are shorter than their friends their same age that weren't taking care of somebody just because of the stress. Um, pessimism has actually been published now to be uh, people who are pessimistic have shorter telomeres than people who are optimistic. So, if you don't think you'll be live to be 100, you're probably right. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a bunch of things. So, so um, uh, lack of exercise. Exercise is really important as long as you don't overdo it too much. Or too much, it's not, overdoing it isn't really the distance or the time you spent doing it. It's how, how hard you push doing it. So uh, that's something 
that can push in exercise really hard, can shorten your telomeres, exercising at a comfortable, more fun pace uh, can actually uh, decrease the rate of their shortening. Um, and I'm trying to think of what else. Omega-3 fatty acids, vitamin D, all those things have been shown to decrease the rate of, of uh, uh, telomere shortening. Uh, antioxidants, same things. All, all antioxidants probably link, uh, decrease the rate of shortening of telomeres. But even if you had the perfect genetics and the perfect lifestyle, your telomeres are still going to short, shorten just due to cell division, which has to occur. And there's some cells in your body, like your guts, your immune system, or your skin cells that divide all the time. They never stop dividing. That's, that's the clock. The, the telomeres are going to get short to 5,000. If, if you have perfect lifestyle, perfect genetics, your telomeres will get to 5,000 bases at 125 years. And so there is no way at the moment for anybody to live longer than 125 years. And because nobody has the perfect genetics and lives the perfect lifestyle, nobody has lived to be 125 years. Uh, one person uh, is reported to have lived to be 122, uh, and now there's a lot of controversy about that because it looks like her daughter took her place and pretended to be her. I've uh, heard that. Yeah, yes, yes. there's, there's a, another woman who... Uh, uh, apparently lived to be 120, which is under investigation right now. But then, then there's so many people. There's a marathon runner who claims to be 108. And even though lots of documentations have shown that he's in his late 70s, really, he still goes around touting that he's 108, gets a lot of publicity, makes a lot of money saying it. Uh, so it's, it's hard to really see. But, you know, nobody has... And, and then also there's, you know, Methuselah and other things that Suppose people who supposedly Noah of Noah's Ark, they've supposedly lived to be close to a thousand years old. Now, now if you Google that and start reading uh, studies on it, you'll find that the definition of a year might have changed. It might have been every full moon. And so uh, living to be a thousand full moons is pretty much equivalent to living to be in your 80s, so 80 years old. So, so it's like, I don't think anybody especially in recorded history, has officially lived to be uh, 125 years. But that's the goal. As soon as, you know, I'm, I want to see somebody live and, and live healthy. I want to see, our goal isn't to just uh, make old people live in hospital beds with tubes sticking in a, out of them. I want to see people playing tennis, uh, you know, ha dancing, having the time of their lives when they're 180 years old. Uh, and uh, uh, because we're not just reversing aging, we're reversing uh, declining health due to aging, too. So, so yeah, that, that's what it's all about. It's just getting there has, has been tough. It's been a tough road. For I've been working on this now since 1993, uh, and we're now just getting ready to test our first humans. Uh, uh, and it, like... Two weeks ago, I spoke at a conference and announced that the first human would be treated early November, but now it's been delayed to early January, and I had no control over that because I, I invented the technology, but I licensed it to another company called Labella Gene Therapeutics, and the emphasis is to make certain that every I is dotted, every T is crossed, every safety issue is in place, and uh, that's why there's been delay after delay. And <laughs> Sometimes I'm the person that says, delay because I wasn't happy with certain things. I actually wrote the clinical protocols that are being used uh, for the uh, clinical studies and, and it's been a tough road just trying to make certain we have every base covered. But uh, yeah, so hopefully hopefully in the next uh, 2020, next year, we'll actually see people get younger and, not, and they look younger, feel younger, behave younger. Um, but I've been through enough clinical studies that I know that there's a few things that could be tweaked, that could need to be tweaked. Uh, and I've been involved in studies going back to the 1980s where, you know, drugs had to be back to the drawing board to figure out why aren't they working as well as they did in mice. And we'd, have, we'd make best guesses and figure it out and then make it work in humans. So sometimes it takes a while. So, I, so hopefully we'll see somebody get younger in 2020. But 
it could take a few tweaking. Maybe we see some side effects that we don't like. Uh, we've got to tweak the system to get rid of those. But that's, that's normal for clinical studies. Will that be in this country or will that be somewhere else? It will be in this country. Um, <clears throat> the new administration, Trump administration, has, has opened the door because a lot of clinical studies can't get done because the researchers can't afford it. Uh, and uh, uh, so the new administration has made two major changes to, to the ability for uh, legitimate companies in the United States to be able to do clinical studies. One is they approve what are called pay-to-play models where the patient can actually pay for their role in the study. Okay, that used to be considered unethical in kind of a way it is unethical, but the fact is what's unethical is if the study can't be done at all because nobody can put the money together to do it. That's, that's the worst, you know, 150,000 people are dying of aging every day. Uh, getting a few super wealthy people to pay for their treatment in the study is going to be helping everybody, okay? I, I don't know if gene therapy is going to be the treatment that everybody gets in the future, but just getting a proof of concept that lengthening telomeres reverses aging will open the door for development of a lot of less expensive ways to be able to treat. The gene therapy, unfortunately, that, that costs about $3 million per dose. And that's not because LaBelle is greedy and trying to make a lot of money. It's because that's how much it costs to produce enough of the gene therapy to produce to, to do all the testing, to pay the doctors, pay the hospitals. It's, it's a very, very expensive proposition. Plus, you have to have insurances, and you have to, you know, there's always a chance somebody's going to have a side effect. You've got to have some way of treating them right away. So, but the other thing is that, the other thing is that Donald Trump has approved that even FDA-approved clinical studies can be done outside the United States because it's cheaper. And then some countries, like Colombia, have really jumped on the bag line. You go to Colombia, and you would be shocked at the quality of the hospitals that they have. Tremendously great hospitals. The doctor-to-patient ratio is the best I've ever seen anywhere. They have everything. They're very interested. Uh, countries like Colombia are really getting focused on doing clinical studies for the United States. So that's most likely where uh, uh, Labella would do its its studies, but there's also other places like Panama, Mexico, uh, 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 places near Asia, uh, Jeju Island, uh, off of South Korea, other places like that too, which are really also jumping on that. Uh, Bunrungrad Hospital in Thailand. Uh, there, there's a lot of places that now U.S. studies can be done outside the U.S. and still be considered U.S. studies. You don't plan to be uh, one of the subjects then in the near future? Uh, if I was suffering from what I call a telomeropathy, uh, <clears throat> where I had a, a telomere shortening disease that was going to cause me to die pretty soon or have a very miserable lifespan, I would be there in a second. But only because of the fact that I've been through so many clinical studies and I know that at the beginning of the phase there is a lot of tweaks that need to be made. There is a lot of things we learn. We're always venturing into the unknown, so we don't know. Um, <clears throat> I would not volunteer myself to be one of the first patients, but if I had, if I was diagnosed with Alzheimer's five years ago, I would be first in line because your chances of living another year are practically zero. And uh, the mouse studies, at least, have shown that memories came back and so that we could possibly reverse Alzheimer's. There's other diseases that are called telomeropathies. And, uh, we have clinical protocols now for uh, like five of them um, that are now are listed on clinicaltrials.gov by the United States government. Uh, the, these include uh, not just Alzheimer's, but uh, 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 critical limb ischemia, which is a very fatal disease, or people have to have their limbs cut off and stuff like that because of um, just ischemia to the limbs. Uh, we're doing cardiomyopathy. Uh, a lot of like, uh, um, you know, maybe this could replace uh, heart transplants. Uh, people die all the time because they can't get a heart transplant in time, but the gene therapy uh, for cardiomyopathy might be the solution. Uh, we have a lot of uh, de demyelating 
syndromes, uh, like multiple sclerosis, um, <clears throat> uh, CDIP. Uh, all these diseases are caused by the nerves or the cells losing their protective coating, uh, which I call the caregiver cells, or they're often called uh, uh, glia cells or Schwann cells. Uh, these things lose the ability to protect the cells because their telomeres get short. So we're, we're hoping that uh, we can correct some of the uh, demyelating diseases like multiple sclerosis and CDIP by uh, this gene therapy. And then, then we're also, we also have a clinical protocol that's now on clinicaltrials.gov, which is just for aging in general. Because the fact is, aging is a terminal disease. Everybody's going to die of aging, but the focus would be to be on the people that are uh, close to dying of aging. Um, people that are having problems, especially the ones that have been keeping a really healthy lifestyle and are in their 90s and still be able to run and things like that. That would be the ideal. But it's, the bottom line is that I always say, uh, you know, there's always a risk, but the biggest risk when you have a telomeropathy or close to dying is not being treated. Uh, it's uh, the treatment is going to be way lower than the risk of not being treated. And, uh, and uh, if you take a person who's 98 years old or 89 years old, let's say 89 years old, their chances of living to be 90 are, are uh, uh, like 11% or something like that. It's, it's so, so every, when you get into your late years, you, you know, you're seeing all your friends the same age dying left and right like flies in a, in a, a pesticide shop. Uh, but the, uh, uh, it's, so it's, your chances of surviving a year every year is pretty low. So even those people are, uh, they're, the safest thing they can do is get treated in this gene therapy. So I would encourage those people. Um, but I personally, until I had a telomeropathy, would not, because I know that there's there's too many things that could possibly go wrong. And still, I mean, maybe 5% probability, which 5% is pretty high for somebody like me, but it'd be pretty low for somebody that was like had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's five years ago. Is there a, uh, at this point, since this is all new, what supplements, other than the ones you've mentioned, is there anything out there? I, I think there was something that you discovered that perhaps had a 16% effect on uh, telomerase. Is that okay. correct? Yes. There, there are, okay, so first, before I describe these, i got to explain that telomere shortening and lengthening is like a tug of war. And, and you have people, so in this tug of war, in all the cells of our body, except for our reproductive cells, um, it's a one-sided tug of war. There's people pulling to shorten your telomeres. And this is an ongoing process. And then they get shorter and shorter and shorter. But when you provide telomerase to the cell, then you are actually providing uh, people to the other side of that tug of war. And so there could be lengthening. Now, the gene therapy is potent enough that it will win that tug of war. But all the supplements that have been developed so far are not strong enough to win that tug of war. They can just slow it down. Okay, they can slow the shorteners down. They can pull in the opposite direction. They're still going to lose. The most potent product on the planet right now that anybody has ever discovered anywhere was discovered by us, and it's called... TAM-818, or telomerase activating molecule 818. And, and let me say, that. it's called 818 because we call it here at research, in our research labs, C0314818 because it was the 314,818th chemical we tested. Uh, they didn't like that name as a product name, so they, they changed it to TAM-818. Uh, and that's available at a company called Defy Time. I think if you just go to defytime.com or defytime is all one word. We don't, we don't sell anything. We, my company just does research. So when we discover something like that, we typically put it on the shelf and wait for some company like Defy Time to come along and say, hey, can we license that from you and turn it into a product? And, and we say, sure, but uh, we want royalties from the sales. And every penny of the royalties goes directly into our research. So it's... Uh, uh, it's a way of, of 
being able to do this research without having to get grants and without having to uh, get investors. So uh, now, so so TAM eight one eight is the most potent uh, thing on the planet, but the most potent natural product is something called isogenesis uh, that is produced by a company called Isogenics, sold and produced by Isogenics. And that works really well. I actually take both because I think there's a good chance that there's synergy. I, in all my studies of the things that regulate the uh, production of telomerase, I've, I've decided that there has to be like multiple things at the same time that are all shutting the gene off and it could be that TAM818 is, is, is dislodging one of those repressors to let the gene per, turn on partially, but the other ones are still there. Isogenesis might be, a, might be uh, dislodging some of the other ones. And then a, a third product, the very, third, very first one that was ever discovered called TA65, this could be dislodging another one. So I, I take all three. You know, I'm, I'm just obsessed uh, with doing this. And... Uh, uh, I feel like I've been extremely healthy. I mean, the fact that I'm even thinking about breaking the world record for a 70-year-old uh, in 100-mile distance uh, uh, is a testimonial to that. And I think a lot of it has to do with I've been focused on trying to protect my telomeres long before I even knew what telomeres were. Uh, but, yeah, so, so the, the, there's a lot of, and, and, you know, this is really bad to say, but the field of anti-aging has more quacks and charlatans in it than any other field on the planet. And there's a lot of other products that are out there saying that they lengthen telomeres, and they don't really, and we, we tested them, uh, <clears throat> we can't get them to work, we'll call the scientists and tell them we can't get it to work, they refuse to talk to us. Uh, it, it's, just, it, it's, just, it's just unfortunate. Uh, I wish we could have like something called the Sierra Sciences Seal of Approval where we could, every time there's a product out there, we could tell that company, um, send some to us so we can verify it works. And then if we show it works, we'll put the Sierra Sciences seal of approval on it. Because we're just research, okay? So we're not, we're not promoting any products. So of course, we do make a royalty off some of them. Uh, and we'd probably, for that seal, we'd probably tell the, even the companies that have products that we didn't invent that we'd want a royalty just to fund our research too. But, uh, uh, <clears throat> It's just that most companies refuse to send them to us, send us samples to test. And you typically can't just buy it yourself and open the pill because there will be things, um, uh, what's, what's it called, uh, steric something. Uh, there, there's chemicals they put in to just encapsulate, the, uh, to, to stuff all the stuff inside of a capsule. And then all that has to be destroyed from the acid in your stomach before the active ingredients get out. So it's really hard for us just to take one of the pills and open them up and test them. We've done it, <laughs> and in all cases they didn't work, um, but uh, they won't send us any of the raw ingredient for us to test. Uh, and a lot of times the raw ingredient isn't known. And in the cases where the right, right ingredient was known, uh, we couldn't get it to work uh, when we bought it ourselves. Uh, and there's like peptides and things like that that are touted as being things that could induce telomerase. We've, we've synthesized those peptides. We've made them in multiple ways. We can't get them to work, uh, and we can't get the scientists that uh, discovered them to uh, tell us what we're doing wrong. So I, I think I just write it off as they don't really work. And if, if something really did work really well, we'd have 95-year-old people walking around looking like and feeling and behaving like they're 25 again. And we don't, not yet. Um, but uh, I'm expecting that to change pretty soon. Well, hopefully you'll watch this interview when we get it <laughs> online. But uh, I want to thank you. Uh, you're an exceptional individual in, in many ways. Uh, first of all, your uh, ability to express your passion for what you've been doing all your life. And you can tell that this is something that you're uh, going to try to defeat if possible, and that is the aging process. And also, the fact that you enjoy running to such an extent that not only do you run uh, marathons, but ultra marathons. And it's just, it seems like you put passion in, in what you do, but you do it in a way that makes it uh, enjoyable. We need more people like you, 
And uh, I'm betting on you. I think that uh, you're going to find that uh, cure for the aging process. And I hope we're around to uh, see it and to reap the benefits. Why not?